I'm going to give you, if I can, three things that you can get out of crisis. Three things that you can get out of crisis. But the first, I want you to know that Jesus isn't startled by the crisis. So I'm going to say startled. I mentioned this story to you, and I want to rehearse it. I shared this a little bit more intimately with our leaders at Reencounter last night, and I, and I want to share this a little bit with you today. We understand that Jesus invited the disciples into the boat because Jesus wanted to cross the other side. So I'm going to say the other side. While they were in the boat, the storm came. Somebody say crisis. The crisis came, and everybody was panicking, and everybody was stirred up. And can I say something? You would have been too. I don't want to sit here and look at the disciples and go, you guys are cowards. Look at, look what, look what people are doing at Costco right now. Listen, I, you should have been at Costco. Whether you were there because you were afraid of the virus or you were, were you, were, or whether you were afraid of the people who were afraid of the virus. Because half the problem isn't the virus. Half the problem is everybody buying everything you don't need. So here's, here's a tip to yourself. My mama taught me this when I was really, really young. And, and, and it serves me well in my marriage and my life with my children. You know, we don't ever worry about toilet paper in the Moreno home. We don't worry about toothpaste. We don't worry about deodorant. What else? Deodorant, tooth, any toiletry in my house. We're like months ahead. Everybody freaking out. We're stacked up. But it had nothing to do with the virus. It's just mama taught me early on. There's some stuff you got to be ready for. You know, you ever hate that, hey, is there any more left? And they're like, no, never happened in my house. Hope it doesn't happen in yours. You want to avoid that? Don't wait for the coronavirus. Get ahead, right? <laughs> crisis comes. Crisis comes. These guys are, and, and crisis, doesn't, crisis doesn't just come to people who are away from God. Crisis comes to people who are next to Christ. We get crisis. Don't be afraid of the crisis. Don't struggle. So what I'm saying is don't, don't, over, don't condemn somebody who overreacts to crisis. I'm trying, Izzy. I'm trying. Because it's easy to sit here and point fingers. Look at you, look at you, look at you, look at you, look at you. So my idea today is not to point fingers about your crisis, right? I, I want to help you. And, and the very important thing I want you to notice about this crisis was Jesus was asleep during the crisis. So while everybody's watching all the news, I was literally on the plane on the way up and was watching people for an hour and a half follow this story. I'm thinking, how much more do you need to know that the coronavirus is spreading and it's coming to a city? You follow what I'm saying? I mean, hour after hour after hour. And listen, if I'm honest with you, the more you subject your mind to that, the more your heart's going to fear. You follow what I'm saying? And if you don't realize this, media has a corner and an agenda, and their corner agenda is to make sure that you're fearful. Pastor Eli, how could you say that? Because it's money. If they were telling you about all the good things in the world, you would be doing something else. We don't watch good news. It's the stuff that freaks us out. Is that the truth? When was the last time you checked your news feed to find out how good life was? We don't. We check it out to see how bad things are. So, so things were bad, and when things were bad, Jesus wasn't tuned in. Jesus wasn't like, hey, Dad, what's the story on the storm? It's going to be a big one. Is it like category four, category five? God, this looks pretty bad. You know what Jesus was doing in the middle of that crisis? sleeping he was sleeping so everybody step one go home and sleep <laughs> right some of you are like that's i knew i should have stayed home and slept <laughs> uh, step number one you know jesus was sleeping and, and and i say that to you because you may have heard this but let me just rehearse it in your ear let me let me help you with some faith this morning the thunder didn't wake jesus now i don't know how light of a sleeper you are but thunder wakes me up. You know what I mean? And if thunder don't wake me up, I promise you that bright lightning, that wakes me up. Let me say, so Jesus is hearing the thunder and he's asleep. Jesus is hearing the lightning and he's asleep. And here's the last thing. Are you ready? You know what a storm in the ocean does to a boat? You ever have that dream like you're falling off a bed? 
and it freaks you out, you should feel the corner, yeah? This boat is doing this action. And Jesus is. So the thunder didn't wake him. The lightning didn't wake him. The waves didn't wake him. What woke Jesus up? It was the voice of his sons in the boat. The father is always listening to the voice of his sons. The storms won't wake him. The lightning won't wake him. The thunder won't wake him. But as soon as he hears the cry of your heart, you will guide Jesus' attention and you will grab the attention of heaven because God cares about what you care about. Make sense? Look at somebody say, my voice wakes the father my voice wakes the father two key scriptures i want to share with you in crisis and i'll give you some stories to back them up in the bible the bible says in first chronicles second chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray turn from their wicked ways i will hear from heaven heal their I will heal their lands. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says that God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. In 2 Chronicles, he said, if my people would humble themselves and pray, I will heal their land. What did God make Adam out of? Land. God made Adam out of? Come on, I know you got, are you hearing me right? Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, God made Adam out of the land. In 2 Chronicles, he said that if we pray, he would heal our Are you tracking? Oh, man, I hope you're getting this. I'm going to read one more scripture to you. Anybody here? I suppose you can wave your hand if you want to. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but anybody here tithe faithfully? All two of you? Anybody here tithe? How many of you ever heard this scripture in Malachi chapter 3? You ever hear that scripture? I'm going to show you something. Something you may have missed in that scripture. And, and I'd like to tell you that, you know, how, how many of you uh, remember getting your first Costco card? I kind of got mad when I went to try to go to Costco and they didn't let me in because I had a card. I'm like, I got money. Yeah, but you don't got a card. Not everybody gets this blessing. It's a membership required. Listen to this. Bring all the tithe. How much? Bring all the tithe to the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now, says the Lord, of heaven's the host. See if I want to open up the windows. See if I want to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there will not be room enough to can receive it. And I will... Rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your, huh. he will not destroy the fruit of your, what were you made out of? You're made out of land and everything you produce is protected when you're a giver. So you, I know if you're a giver, this is resonating to you. Because, because listen to me, there's going to be 40 million people get coronavirus. There's going to be a hundred, hundreds of them will get worse strands of the flu. But the Bible says when you're faithful to the Lord that a thousand will fall on one side and 10,000 will fall on the other side, but no harm will come near you. And all the non-givers are, givers are looking for their Costco card right now. That's just one. I'm, I'm going to do some reading today. I want to encourage your faith today. What do I do, Pastor Eli, um, what do I do in the middle of crisis? Somebody say crisis. One of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Acts. If you have your Bible, you can come with me to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter 16. Somebody say crisis. Let's start reading here at verse 16. Now it happened that as they went to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination. Uh, uh, I'm going to hurry up. Let me go to verse 20. Uh, they brought the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful to be in Romans to receive and observe. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Somebody say crisis. Crisis. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they threw them in the prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. 
having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet with stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaking, and immediately the doors were opened and everybody, somebody say everybody, everybody's chains were loose. Can I take you there? Paul was the old guy. Paul was the old guy, and um, Silas was the young guy. And after getting beaten, somebody say beaten. Silas was like, did I make the right decision following you? Paul was like, what do you mean? He goes, man, I wanted to preach Jesus. I didn't want to get beat up. I didn't mean for this to happen. I didn't want this to be the world. I didn't want this to be what I signed up for. And then, and then he says to Paul, Paul, have you, ever, have you ever been through anything like this? And Paul goes, yeah, yeah, I have. He goes, what was it like? He goes, man, I was actually living the life I didn't want to live. And then one day, God did something inside of me that changed my world. He's like, what do you mean? He goes, I was shackled, but it was a different kind of shackle. I was shackled by religion and tradition, and I couldn't get out. And one day, one day he touched me and turned my life around. He goes, well, what do you mean? Well, I, I think if Paul was ministering to Silas, he probably would have said, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that flood my soul. you hold when he knocked you off the horse but you got blind he goes oh no 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 I got blinded to the negative things and for the first time in my life I started seeing things the right way amen he said sing it with me he said sing it with me and I, I could hear silence going he touched he me touched said that as Paul and Silas began to praise in the crisis that their chains began to fall off that would be pretty amazing if you were the one in chains right isn't that amazing but but Drew didn't stop there the Bible said that what he did for Paul and Silas people were listening and it started happening all around them what you do in crisis people are listening to and it starts happening all around us. And what started off as he touched me turned into our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Lord, you are mine than any other. Awesome in healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Come on, say our God. Our God is stronger. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God in power, awesome in power. Could you hear the jail singing? Could you hear the prison?
prisoner singing started one person then the next person said our God is greater the next person our said God is stronger our God is all of a sudden everybody in prison started changing their song voices started changing stories started changing because there was a praise in the house and fear could no longer survive our God our God is God is strong our God The world does not need you to imitate their fear. The world does not eat us to go ahead and continue to reiterate the trial. We know there's a storm. We know there's a struggle. We know there's a virus, but is anybody saying our God is stronger? Our God is greater. Our God is bigger. It's time for the church to stand in the middle of crisis and say, yeah, Goliath, you are big, but my God is greater. My God is stronger. My God is mightier. These chains can't hold me. These stocks can't hold me. And this virus, you better sit down before I get Pentecostal on you. Woo! You know, it sounds silly until your chains start falling. It, start, it sounds silly until you walk through the valley of shadow and death and when death tries to grab you and shadows try to grab you and the things of this world try to grab you but they keep falling off you. It doesn't make sense because it's not secular but it's not supposed to be secular. It's sacred. It's sacred. Some things you can't get through wisdom and understanding. Some things come by faith and expectation. You can't say amen. You can say aye, aye, aye. Crisis is real. Crisis should be respected. This book of Acts is filled with amazing stories. So the first thing, the first thing is keep your praise. Look at someone say, keep your praise. See how con you think Corona's contagious? Feel the vibe in this place? Can you feel the vibe of praise in this house? What's it doing to your heart right now? What's it doing to your mind right now? Can you feel it? Y'all better quit. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Numbers and in the book of Leviticus that after God had taken the children of Israel out of Egypt and slavery, that he was bringing them into the promised land. He was bringing them into the promised land. And the Bible says in them that they sent 12 spies. 12 spies. And when the, 10 spy, when the 12 spies came back, they all came back with their report. They came back with their report. And, and two of them... Twelve, ten of them said, here was their report, the giants are too big. Yeah, the land is good, but the trial is too big. Yeah, the land is good, but that's a dangerous virus in that land. And if we go in there, we're liable to die by the virus that's in the land. That was their report. But there was two of them, Lee. There's two of them whose report was a little different. They said, wait a minute, the sea was bigger than our ability. 
Egypt was bigger than our ability. There were 10 plagues that were bigger than us. And all we did to overcome those 10 plagues was stand under the lentil that was covered by the blood of Jesus. And if the same God that got us through the sea, is he not still able to get us in? For 40 years, those two men held on to the same praise. When trial came and tribulation came, year after year, they never released the same praise. And 40 years later, when all those people who came out of Egypt died in the wilderness, there was only two people who walked in the promise. You want to know who they were? The two who never stopped their praise. The two that never changed their praise. I'm not saying that you need to be fake. I'm not saying you're not going to get into prison. I'm not saying that there's not going to be disappointments. What if you get the coronavirus? I'm going to praise. I saw saw two posts. I thought they were funny. First of all, it said Mexico was putting up borders, going to secure the borders so that nobody brings coronavirus into Mexico because nobody has it over there. And I saw another one I liked even better. And they said, why is coronavirus not in Mexico? Because we still use caldo de pollo, bix, and seven up. (laughs) That's funny, right? That's funny. That's funny, but you know the truth is? I just, it really doesn't matter to me if I get the coronavirus. It doesn't matter to me if I get diabetes. It doesn't matter to me if I get cancer. It doesn't matter if, if the doctor says to me, your body is not functioning. Because I got a promise that came over 2,000 years ago. That 39 stripes on the back of my Savior were placed there to remind me that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond whatever I could face. Sickness, my friend, is not the end of the story. Sickness, my friend, will never be my identity. If you got to fight the virus till your last breath, when you leave this earth, you will be forever with the Lord. Keep your praise. Your praise. If we die, remember the three Hebrew boys? If we die, we're going out in style, my friend. All right, get a little too preachy for some of you right now. (laughs) Acts chapter 12, the first thing is hold on to your praise in crisis. Here's the second thing, Acts chapter 12, start reading here at verse 13. Let's start at verse 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary. Oh, let me back up a little bit more. Well, I'm just going to tell you. I'll start at 13. And Peter knocked at the door of the gate, and a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, uh, excuse me, when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, ta loca. (laughs) They said to her, she's crazy. She's crazy. Yet they kept insisting, she kept insisting it was so. So they, you didn't see that in your translation? (laughs) It's his angel, they said. It's his angel. Start making stories up. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him and were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought them out of prison. Go and tell these things to James and the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. The crisis in this moment was that the apostles were now being um, individually sought after to be killed. They had just killed one of Peter's co-disciples. Just killed him. And now Peter was put in jail because he was about to be killed in the morning. When the virus came, that was certain. This was not, I wonder if he got it. This is, he got it. He was convicted and he was about to be murdered in the morning. And you know what the people of the Lord did? And this may seem silly to you because, Pastor, I know this. I, I know you do. Let me ask, well, so let me tell you what they did, first of all. They gathered in a house. 
and they began to pray. What is the honest consistency of your prayer life? What is the honest consistency of your prayer life? (laughs) Sometimes we pray because we know we're supposed to and don't even believe what we pray. We're doing this because we're supposed to do it because we're Christians, right? Good meat, (laughs) good bread, good meat, good God. Let's eat. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Lord, don't let my kids be hoodlums. Take care of them. Jesus, amen. God, let my wife love me in the morning today. Amen. Uh, Most of our prayers are really, if if we can just be honest, you're sincere, but they're kind of nonchalant. You know what I mean? Uh, Not a real heavy intercession for prayer, a heavy pursuit for prayer. So so when the crisis came, Tommy, when the crisis came, the Bible says they were in one room and one accord they began to pray. They began to pray. And watch this. As they began to pray... God heard, this is what the Bible said, Pastor. I'm not writing this down. The Bible said that God heard their, didn't say he heard Peter's prayer. Although I believe Peter was praying. But the Bible said that he heard their prayer and sent an angel over. If you've ever prayed for the elderly in our community, it's time right now to pray for the elderly in our community. I know I got, I got two amens and some of you are like, hey, that was good, that was good. That was good. That local, that was good. You know, pa- Pastor Eli, uh, uh, I, I do pray. No, listen to me. How many of you have, uh, like, Tupperware? I know they don't do Tupperware no more, Harley, huh? But what, what's a, they do Tupperware? A Rubbermaid party. How many of you, how many, how many do Tupperware parties? How many of you guys doing little parties? Anybody doing, no? You don't go to little parties and buy candles? Quit it, dude. I seen you buying candles the other day. <laughs> He's like, not me, Pastor. I'm out. I ain't expecting you to do that. But we get together for barbecues. How many of you get? I don't even do UFC. I was watching UFC the other night. I told my wife, man, I haven't seen the UFC in, in feels like years. But we gather for stuff, right? We we gather for stuff that's really not significant. Just I, just I just want you to think about this for a moment. When was the last time you gathered outside of coming here corporately to pray? To just go, God. We need you to move. Watch this. I love Christians who are political because I think you should do something about your politics. I think it's silly when Christians are more political than they are prayers. Because your vote will do nothing compared to your prayer. (laughs) That's okay. You don't have to clap. I don't know, man. No, no. Your vote's important. If you didn't vote, you need to vote. But nothing is going to change our world like prayer nothing's going to take the chains off like prayer nothing's going to develop like prayer so i want to encourage you is prayer something that you kind of do lightheartedly is that something like you kind of just check the box are you like hey bring some chorizo bring some dumplings bring some hey we're gonna hang out and we're gonna come here and we're gonna pray till the house comes down we're gonna pray till something happens and, and, and i'll be honest with you but say virus. virus i hope this virus re-engages america I see what we're talking about. No, we are disengaged. We are disengaged. You're so busy. Watch this. Um, America keeps us so busy in our culture that it takes two incomes to survive in a home. And those of you on a single income with children, you almost don't even have a fighting chance. You are sacrificing your children at the altar of trying to make money. And your children are raising people that you don't really know, you, you, you do all the research, baby, you can do all the research you want. None of us see it coming. It catches us by surprise. That's why it hurts so much. Because you thought you did all that you could do. So, so, so we're, 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 we're needing to, as Americans, re-engage. Re-engage in what? How about your family? When was the last time you prayed as a family? When was the last time... I was telling this story the other day. There was reading a story about a, a lawyer in Chicago, very, very successful lawyer, lived in the penthouse, top of the penthouse, and um, he would walk to, to work every day because he was, his office was just a few blocks from his penthouse. And um, he was one of those guys that you would call a high-functioning alcoholic. And so he was able to stop by the bar, get lit, and continue to do his practice without any problem. Until one day in Chicago, it was snowing, and he was doing his normal routine, and he was walking, just kind of watching the snow. And he went back, just kind of looked out the corner of his eyes to see what kind of footprints he was leaving. And then he saw that somebody was following him, doing this. 
It was his 10-year-old son. And he thought, if I turn into this bar right now, my son will follow my footsteps. If you want to know the, in, the, the level of your prayer life, look at your children. Because if you got an attitude, I know your children got one. <laughs> Awful quiet in this great Baptist house. We're going to need a prayer session right now for your attitude. All right, Lord Jesus, take the chains off. Amen. I know if you got a good discipline, guess what? Your kid's going to have good discipline. If you keep a tidy house, chances are your kids are going to be tidy. Come on, if you pile stuff everywhere. <laughs> How many of you got mountains and mountains in your house? And we're not talking about the Cascades. Come on, somebody. Yeah, you can't expect your kids not to be what you are. So if you don't pray, how will your kids ever learn to pray? If you don't have a dependency on God, how will your children ever depend on God? No, we need to re-engage, guys. This prayer thing is not a cool idea. This prayer thing is not like, oh, okay, well, we should pray, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then what do you do in crisis? In crisis, you pray. You pray, well, I, I pastor, like, my prayers last like 30 minutes. Can, can I say something to you? Any, anybody remember working out for the first time? I think I shared this with you last week, my first time. I was up on, when well, I was even my first time. You just, I hadn't worked out in a long time, say, and I'm out here, and I'm, I'm told Teresa I was going to get on the treadmill. I'm on the treadmill, and then she comes back, and I'm on the floor, and I'm like, <sighs> I can't even breathe. And, and she goes, what's wrong with you? I said, I just finished my workout. She goes, how long did you run for? I said, three minutes. <sighs> <sighs> Don't laugh. I mean, that's exactly how you felt your first three minutes. Right? But how many of you run a little longer than three minutes and you're not dying like I was dying? You know why you can do that? Because you push through the pain of your first three minutes. That's why many of you don't have a prayer life because you can't push through the first three minutes. When, when I want to do something, I, I will buy or I will download information on that subject. If I want to fix something, I'm not a mechanic, I'm going to go down to YouTube. Sean Diddy, hallelujah, thank God for the Holy Ghost name, YouTube, right? And I'll go down to YouTube and I'll get some information. Or I'll get a book and I'll get some information. And the truth is a lot of us will excuse ourselves from prayer because we don't know how to, but you won't do anything to learn. In this crisis, flex your prayer muscles. Do those push-ups. Everybody's favorite, them Holy Ghost burpees. Come on, somebody. Get those burpees on. That's you like, why? Because there are people in a coronavirus prison who God has put an assignment on your life to pray their freedom in. Got to pray it in, Pedro. We got to pray it in. Somebody say pray it in. We got to pray it in. So first thing we're going to do in crisis, we're going to keep our praise. Keep your praise. I think I could have stayed another 15 minutes on that one, but we're going to move on. Number two is prayer. I'm going to read to you for a moment an Old Testament scripture. And if you have your Bibles, you can come with me to the book of Esther. Esther chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 13. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than any other Jew. Look at somebody say, you're in the same mess. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. God's going to get the victory over this coronavirus with us or without us. Did you catch that? God would love to use us, but he's not going to wait on us forever. And so here's what he says to Esther. He says, uh, deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows? Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? I'm going to be honest with you. I like this time of year. First of all, the cold is leaving. Thank you, Jesus. Apparently, it's hanging on here a little longer, but I love when the cold is leaving. You know what else I love about this time of year? The NBA finals are approaching. You know what I love about this time of year? March Madness. 
You know what I love about this time of the year? All us crazy cowboy fans start believing we could win again. The difference between a cowboy fan and a Seattle fan is we're honest. <laughs> Can I say something to you, JC? It's sports time. I love it. What if God canceled sports because he's calling me to a level of destiny I've been too busy to see? What if, what if coronavirus is nothing more than an opportunity for you to step in the ministry that you know for years God has called you to, but you've meandered through this busyness, you've meandered through this life you've been living, and you've been to hear just, God, one day, God, one day. Well, what if today God stops the United States of America because he wants to grab your attention? What if it was nothing more, Esther, so that you can rise and take a step into the level? You can be in the palace and never make a difference. You can be in the world and never make a difference. It was the crisis that took an average Hebrew girl who was in the palace and not doing anything. It was the crisis that took her to the king's palace and said, this is the day that you were made for, Esther. This, what if, what if this prayer time, what if this praise time was nothing more than for you to find your purpose? Your purpose. Maybe God called you to a ministry that you haven't paid attention to. Maybe God called you to say something and do something. Maybe this is the time that God called you to write your book. Maybe this is the time that God called you to write your songs. Maybe this is the time that God called, oh my God, what are we going to do? All the jobs. They're canceling all the jobs. There's no money. Oh, government. They're government. Government help you. Thank God for the United States of America. Thank God for the government. But when did you put your trust in the government? David said, I don't put my trust in the horses or chariots of men. I put my trust in the name of the Lord. Hey, saints, stop trusting in the government. Stop trusting in society. You got the source of all creation. You got the source of all power. He's your father. What? If God sent this or allowed this so you can get off of your seat of comfort and step into your place of purpose. So that you can stop being on. Am I making anybody mad? Are you mad about? I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm trying to stir up something on the inside of you that God would pause the world because He's waiting for you to step up. Pastor Eli, God wouldn't do something like that. You want to bet? Ask Esther. Ask Esther. The whole entirety of the Jewish community was on hold so that one young girl could step up. And with her valor, and with her courage, and with her prayer, and with her praise, she could change the world as we know it today. Today we have the Jewish community because of one girl. What will we look back and go for six weeks, God stopped the world. And in those six weeks, this is what God did with me. This is what God did in me. My family was disjointed, but this six weeks gave us a time to come together again. My heart was hurting. I was discouraged and depressed. But in this six weeks, God gave me hope again. God, there's somebody around you who's in jail and in prison. And the only reason, only reason that Paul and Silas were in jail that day is because not only did God want to free them, but he wanted to free those people who would have never heard their praise. Those people would have never heard their praise if Paul and Silas weren't in that crisis. Maybe the purpose was so that their praise could infect everybody else. Maybe it's the same for you. Maybe it's the same for you. You know, every time I woke up on Sunday morning, Joe, my mama would be making eggs or barbacoa. And Jimmy Swaggart was playing in the, you remember them old radios that were like big like this? And then you had the turntable, and then you changed the radio like this. Big old things like that, big old speaker box like that. Playing Jimmy Swaggart every Sunday morning on the piano. And then, then later on when she got modern, she played Dallas Holmes. None of you remember no Dallas Holmes. Because I'll rise again. Yeah. <laughs> What's in your house? Everybody's getting toilet paper. 
Did you bring some praise? Everybody's stocking up on water. Did you get some prayer? What if this season of praise and prayer began to set the level of your purpose? Get your toilet paper. You need it. Get your water. You need it. But don't you put your praise down. Don't you put your prayer down. Make sure that we allow God to take us to our point of destiny. I'm going to end by saying this today. I don't know where Jay's at, but y'all play something to make people cry back in there. Anybody grateful for firefighters? You know what a firefighter does? He doesn't run from the fire. The firefighter runs to the fire. How many of you are glad for police officers? Police officers don't run from gunfire. They run to the gunfire. What would America be like without the EMTs who don't run from the sickness but run? Pastor Lee, in the book of Numbers... The Bible said that a plague befell Israel. And the plague was spreading so fast that within the first 24 hours, almost 30,000 people died from the plague. God said to Moses, tell Aaron to grab the incense and wave it back and forth and stand amongst the people. And the Bible said that Aaron got the incense, which represents prayer. And he swung it back and forth, which represents praise. And the Bible said that Aaron stood between the living and the dead. And you know what he had in his hand? His prayer and his praise. And the Bible said the plague stopped. You know, what are you saying? You and me, we are Aaron. The Bible said the church is the hope of the local world. It is so important that you have the right posture today, that you don't walk around with the spirit of fear, but that you and I be the first responders. Thank you for responding today online. Thank you for gathering online. Thank you for responding here today. Thank you for being a first responder. So, when you get a friend who calls you and says, oh my God, I got a family member that has the coronavirus, don't hang up on them because you don't want to get it. It's not airborne and it doesn't come through text. Don't feed the fear. Feed their faith. Feed their fear. Feed their faith. Say, hey, can I say something to you? Jesus Christ is still a healer. Jesus Christ is still a savior. Jesus Christ is still a deliverer. And if you'll raise your voice in the middle of your storm, you'll get up. You'll come to the edge of your coronavirus. You'll come to the edge of your divorce. You'll come to the edge of your struggle. And he will command it to stop. The plague stopped when Aaron went out. The storm stopped when Jesus went out. I want to grab a chandelier and swing like a Pentecostal crazy. Because the plague will stop when the church of the living God stands to its feet and goes out. You and I have been called to be the first responders. It's not by power. It's not by might. But by his spirit, we can stop the plague in Jesus' name. Believe it. Believe it. Changing Point Church is committed to help you. For those of you who are going to be home, and don't have anything to do with your kids besides a binge on Netflix.
We're going to send you some Bible studies that you can walk your children through. <laughs> Go figure that you would actually teach your children what the Bible says. Yeah. What if we went back to the way the Bible taught us, Joe? That the father was the priest of his home. And if you got a crazy husband, then girl, borrow his yarmulke. You don't know what a yarmulke is? You know, a little thing a priest with? Be the priest of your home. Bring Jesus back to your home. Don't spend more time on Netflix than you do teaching your babies how to pray. Teach them to pray. Teach them to praise. Pastor Eli, oh, oh, your kids love the Lord. You don't got those challenges. Oh, no, my friend. Those challenges hit my home, too. And you know why? Because you can ask my mama. She's right here. I was the demon in my house, Art. I, I, I hated church. That's the, I hated it. I didn't like church. I didn't like church people. I thought they were crazy. But one day, like Saul, I had a touch from God because I had a mama and daddy who prayed. Church, rise. Church, rise. Church, rise. Whatever arena you're in, rise. Wherever God has you, don't insulate. Don't get crazy. If, if, if you have to stay home, listen, I, I really believe they're going to shut us down completely for about 10 to 12 days, completely. Like stores, like restaurants, like everything, 10 to 12 days. They want to isolate the disease. I still think it's fear. It doesn't matter. But just because they isolate you doesn't mean you need to be isolated. Find a way. Communicate. Call. Stay connected. Pray. Develop relationships. Let this moment be a moment you look back to and said, we seized the opportunity. We seized it. I'm trying to end this, Joe. I'm trying to end. I promise you I'm trying to end. But crisis makes you better if you let it. I'll share this one moment with you with my wife and I. Um, we're pastors, right? Uh, thankful for that you're here and that you're under this leadership. But even as pastors, oftentimes 1,700 pastors a month quit the church. 1,700 a month pastors leave their church. You know why? Because most pastors spend their time preparing to, to feed you and they don't eat themselves. So Teresa and I, Teresa and I keep really busy, and this was a really big weekend for us. We had our re-encounter weekend. <laughs> That's a minimum of eight hours of teaching to the same group of people. We were going to do that this weekend. On Monday, Tuesday morning, I get a phone call. Tuesday morning, I get a phone call from Bob Harrison that says, Eli, I want you to come to California, and I want you to interpret. That's what I said, Maui. I told you stuff was feeling slow right now. Come to Maui, and I want you to interpret for some of the most amazing speakers in the planet right now. Four hours a day, I was going to interpret for Jensen Franklin, for John Brevere, Butch Hartman, some of the Fortune 500, if I told you who Butch Hartman was you would, or what he did, you would know who he was. Some of the Fortune 500 businesses, and I haven't spoken Spanish professionally in 15 years. I ordered some mean tacos, but that, Spanish is a whole nother world. So, Jamie, I sat in my house and I started interpreting all the cartoons, all the commercials, everything I'm watching. I'm in the radio, I'm interpreting, 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 interpreting. And then my wife goes, are you really going to leave me? to teach this whole weekend by myself and I'm like ah yeah <laughs> I said do you expect me not to answer this call and go minister at this level how many know there's tension how many know that's crisis you know what we did we duked it out she won <laughs> no we sat down together and we said God you set this up this was not a crisis we created. 
This was a crisis you created. So I need you right now to strengthen my wife. We came up with a plan. I recorded two of the sessions via video that turned out to be good. Was it good, guys? Yeah? Was it good? Yeah? She taught two sessions. I landed as soon as I landed the airplane. My kids dropped my truck off. I came straight here and finished up the event with her. Meanwhile, for four days, I was downloading to a whole nation the message of opportunity and blessing concerning the words. What was the ability that made that happen? When we came home, stuff was hot. Not in a negative way, in a good way. It was hot in my home. Matter of fact, matter of fact, matter of fact, again, I just share that. It's just for effect. Listen to me. When, when Teresa saw my truck pull in, when she saw you, she saw my truck pull in. She right, three seconds, she made a beeline straight out to go see her husband. And, and Angel, one of, uh, one of our, our church attenders, was getting off of his truck to come give me a hug. And she looked at him. She said, stay in your truck. <laughs> Poor Angel, you should have seen his face. He was like. <laughs> Here's what I'm saying. She came and she threw her arms around me while I'm on a phone call with a multimillionaire. And I said to him, hey, my wife's here. I got to go. Bye. I hung up on him. I embraced my wife. Because what kept us through the crisis was not her ability to speak, not my authority to be a man, her authority to be a woman. She was gonna, we didn't show each other which was stronger. We led each other to the one who was stronger. The trajectory of our church is going to change. The trajectory of our marriage is going to change. Our whole landscape is going to change because in crisis... There are three things we did. We held on to our praise. We increased our prayer. And we let God bring us to our purpose. And I pray to God today that you will do the same. Would you stand to your feet with me?